I'm Sebastian Mafut, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. our heart, if we listen to it, and we listen carefully, we spend time alone with God, you can hear it. He wants to set us all on fire, and I'm standing up right now talking to you, and I got my arms in the air. The other ways that we, uh, we, we are to be with others, especially who are struggling, and to walk with them in ways that lead them into a deeper experience of their faith. Welcome to I Thought You'd Like to Know This, a program featuring some very interesting people who may have a message for you. Welcome to I Thought You'd Like to Know This Too. I am your host, Carlos Bersabe, continuing the Lord's work on air for Bob Olson. We have another interesting guest for today's show, Matthew Kalinin Hoffman. Matthew is an essayist and journalist whose articles have appeared in numerous publications worldwide, both secular and Catholic, including the Wall Street Journal, London Sunday Times, Detroit News, New York Daily News, LifeSite News, Catholic World Report, Crisis Magazine, and the National Catholic Register. He is the translator and author of the Book of Gomorrah and St. Peter Damien's Struggle Against Ecclesiastical Corruption, written in 2015. He holds an M.A. in Philosophy from Holy Apostles College and Seminary, where he is certified for academic competency in five foreign languages. He currently resides in Mexico, where he does specialized coverage of Latin America for various publications. He can be contacted at M. Hoffman, Hoffman spelled H O F F M A N, at lifesitenews.com. And Matthew is here to talk about the to- a topic of imminent importance the Book of Gomorrah and its relation to the current sexual abuse scandal occurring in the Catholic Church. But before we go any further, let's go ahead and bow our heads in an opening prayer. And Matthew, if you could do us the honors. Uh, sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask uh, for your graces. Please pour out your graces upon us to glor- glorify you in this conversation and to uh, to w- present well the the teachings of, of St. Peter Damien in the Book of Gomorrah and uh, to present his example to all of us uh, in this day of crisis. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And so I normally start the show a little away from the beaten path of the normal how do you do's, and I'm going to ask you something different. So I understand you live in Mexico, and we just had Thanksgiving, and here in the United States, what, if anything, do you miss about living in the United States? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I do, I do miss Thanksgiving a a bit. Uh, it's, it's, it's made up for by so many other festivals that we have here in Mexico, but I miss that a bit. Uh, I do miss also the, the, the very orderly nature of society in the United States. It, uh, it's much more, the, the law is, is much better enforced and, um, so uh, you can count on things working in a much more orderly way in the United States. So those things I miss, but there are many, many other things that make up for it in Mexican uh, culture. And and I, I love living here in Mexico. I've been here for 13 years, so obviously I do I do enjoy living here, and uh, and uh, and and I'm I'm satisfied to stay. Wow, 13 years! What brought you to Mexico? Uh, I decided to move to Mexico. Really well, I did. I I I came to the conclusion uh, after I had my conversion to the Catholic faith. It was sort of a conversion and a reversion to the Catholic faith in my mid twenties. Uh, 
I'd gone through a very terrible crisis, a personal crisis. I was an atheist, and I'd abandoned the faith. I'd never been confirmed in the church. And uh, God, by his merciful grace, rescued me from myself. Uh, almost, uh, almost lost my life. I almost killed myself. It was a very uh, a terrible time in my life. And uh, when I when I started to head back into the church, I began to research different religions, and I began to uh, focus on Christianity and particularly Catholicism. I didn't particularly want to be a Catholic because I'd had a lot of scorn for the Catholic Church after I'd left it, but I began to focus on it more and more. And as I did, I, be, I found myself less and less attracted to sort of Anglo-Protestant culture of the United States and more and more attracted to Hispanic culture. Um, I found myself uh, entertaining the idea of moving to a Latin American country, and I didn't really know why at first, and then I realized it was because of that Catholic influence on those cultures. And so from that point, from about my mid-20s until I finally made the move uh, at, at the age of well, I was, I was 35 years old. It was 2006. In January of 2006, I had the ambition of moving to Latin America. So it was about 10 years, and uh, I finally made the move. Uh, I sold my car. I quit my job, put my things in storage, and moved to Mexico. And uh, I've, I've lived here ever since. That's amazing. And that's one of the beautiful characteristics of the Catholic Church is that, you know, a Catholic worldwide – uh, that's that's awesome, and that at some point you're gonna have to. Well, hopefully you, you'll want to share with me your conversion reversion story, because it sounds like it's a very powerful one. And uh, glad to have you back in the church. Uh, that that's awesome, and and you've been doing great things. You you even, as I mentioned in your bio, uh, you went to Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Yes. Uh, and that was, I'm, I'm guessing, through their online uh, education program. Yes, exactly. It was that's the master's program in philosophy, and uh, Holy Apostles has has two master's programs. One in, well, I, I think actually there are three, but the ones I recall right now are the philosophy and the theology. I may actually want to do the theology as well. Uh, but uh, yes, I got a master's in in philosophy, and uh, I'm very grateful to Holy Apostles for providing that online. It's really excellent. I think so, too. For me, I went through the theology program, and I highly recommend it. One of the things that I don't ever have to worry about with Holy Apostles, at least I didn't encounter it, was their fidelity to the teachings of the Catholic Church. I tell you, when you haven't heard this story unless you listened to one of the a previous episode, but I went to a Catholic college uh, not too long ago that— Man, the ethics and morality teacher was a ex-nun turned into an Anglican priestess who, when we were talking about um, abortion, especially Humana Vitae, she was definitely pro-abortion, which I couldn't believe, and she's teaching at a Catholic mm -hmm. college. And so wow. um, that led me to figure out, hey, and this was, you know, probably a year after having come back to the church, and I was struggling to figure out why a Catholic college wasn't teaching what the Catholic ch uh, church taught, I, I was like, man, and then I found Holy Apostles. So I, I know that your pedigree is definitely good if you're from that school. At least I, I'm going to make that assumption, and especially after reading uh, the Book of Gomorrah and St. Peter Damien's struggle against ecclesiastical corruption. My goodness. Now, it, that's the full title of it. Who exactly is St. Peter Damien? Well, St. Peter Damien is, uh, is a saint and a canonized saint, obviously, and a, but also a doctor of the Catholic Church. He was a cardinal, uh, a bishop, who lived in the 11th century. He was also a monk and a very austere monk. He was sort of an eremitic monk, lived in a sort of uh, uh, hermitage, sort of a collective hermitage that was some community life, obviously, but but uh, much of it was lived in solitude. And uh, he was an amazing man living in a very, very difficult time in the church's history. Uh, he was born in the early part of the, uh, of the 11th century uh, at a time when the church was really in chaos in Italy in many ways because of centuries of barbarian invasions, uh, invasions by various groups – 
the Mayars, uh, there were some Muslim attacks on the Italian peninsula, but all of Europe had been convulsed by these terrible invasions. And so really Europe was coming out of what historians even to this day tend to call the Dark Ages. Uh, the Dark Ages are not a period of time that cover the entire uh, entire period of the Middle Ages, but they are a period, that there is truly a period in the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, that are often called the Dark Ages precisely because, uh, or, the, or a dark period, it was, it was a very dark period, precisely because there was such a breakdown of civilization due to this second wave of barbarian invasions that uh, strikes Europe from about about eight, we could give the date of about 887, that's the fall of the Carolingian Empire, which is the sort of second incarnation of the Roman Empire in the West, and um, or at least in name. And then from it extends from about 887 to about 1049, 1050 AD. So it's a very obscure period, and, and Damien's born into that period, and uh, and and in that time of uh, terrible crisis of the church, he rose up to become really the pr- probably, I would say, the greatest reformer in the church's history, certainly one of them. And he's terribly forgotten today. It's sad. But he was an incredibly courageous reformer who fought against the corruption that existed in the church, that all this disruption to the church's life had brought uh, in its wake a lot of corruption uh, in church in various kinds of practices in the church. Uh, and and Damien was a, a very valiant fighter against uh, against that corruption, and uh, very well known in his day, but today somewhat forgotten, sadly. And uh, so, my book actually, the biographical account of Damien's life at the beginning covers that that struggle against ecclesiastical corruption, as the title says. Right. And so, when you say corruption, and when you say, you know, all all you know, the the tumultuous time that he was reforming. Uh, what is exactly the corruption that needed to be reformed at that time? Well, there were multiple there were multiple problems the church faced at that time. Uh, sorry, you probably can hear that siren in the background. It's all right, so long as it's uh, not for you. <laughs> it's, uh, I could, I, yeah, I could, I'm, I'm fine. Um, so I, um, so so yes, yeah, so the the corruption in the church was. Uh, multifarious. There were there was terribly uh, this problem, the crisis that Damien faces with the Book of G- Gomorrah that he he addresses, which is the corruption of the of the priesthood, the moral corruption of the priesthood, and there were two forms of that. One was uh, that many priests uh, had concubines or or were illicitly marrying. Um, the church's law really did not permit them to marry in the West, but they were marrying, or at least the church's tra- strong tradition. We can debate whether or not their marriages were really licit or not, I think he would have said that they were not licit. Uh, certainly the church ultimately ruled that they are not licit. Uh, right. Marriages by priests are not li- illicit. Um, unless, of course, there's a dispensation given, of a person can become a priest uh, who is already married. But that's only in cases, rare cases of dispensations in the West. In the East, they are permitted to become priests if they are married. But then if their spouse dies, they can't marry again. Right. The, so that was going on. There was quite a bit of it, and it wasn't it wasn't just illicit marriages or controversial marriages by priests who weren't supposed to be doing it, but also they had concubines. They had they were living a very uh, morally loose existence in various ways. Uh, there was controversy about them engaging in all sorts of personally objectionable behavior. Uh, they were seen at gambling dens and all sorts. Of, it was becoming this had become very common. Extremely low morality among the clergy. And probably the worst example of this was the the problem of of the practice of sodomy. To be quite frank, and that's the word that Damien mm. uses for it. Uh, that had spread among the clergy, uh, both uh, both uh, solitary acts of sodomy and 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 and, and with others. And uh, so Damien writes the Book of Gomorrah to address that. There are also other other problems in the church at that time. There's a terrible problem of simony. Simony mm. was rampant in the church. And Damien wrote against that as well, but he also moderated the the uh, the, the the statements that some would make. Uh, there there was a cardinal at the time who claimed that uh, seminaic um, ordinations were actually invalid ordinations. So a person who had paid uh, to explain to to the listeners what simony is, it's people paying for uh, their ordination, for example, or paying for a sacrament. And of course, that's a sin. It's a very grave sin. Right. Uh, 
And uh, they often would be willing to pay for it because there was an income associated with the position that they would receive in the church when they were ordained. And there were many priests that had had to pay their bishops uh, to be ordained. Perhaps they were even forced to pay. But whatever the case may be, uh, simony was a terrible problem. And there was even a concern that actually the people who had done this were not were not even validly ordained, that they, that they weren't priests at all and they couldn't confect the sacrament. Damien clarified always that, no, that's not the case. Uh, the, the sins committed by the minister don't affect the, the validity of a sacrament. The sacrament's still valid if, if the people have the right matter, what we would say today is specifically matter, form, and intention, right? Right. Um, but at the same time, of course, he denounced this sin terribly, uh, very strongly, and uh, fought against it uh, vigorously. So that's just another example of the corruption. There was also a lot of ignorance in the clergy. The, they, they, many of them couldn't um, couldn't read Latin very well. They weren't educated in Latin properly. And at that time, Latin was the language not only of the church but of of learning in general. Right. Uh, almost everything of consequence was written in Latin at that time. And so Damien also uh, uh, wrote against that that problem. And and many others, he was constantly crusading to to restore the church to its its integrity, its uh, earlier earlier state of integrity before this terrible period of disruption that had occurred in the in the immediately preceding cent- centuries. Now you mentioned sodomy just a little bit ago. What when I read the book, sodomy had more than just the meaning that most people would conceive of today. Can you go into that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sodomy. Well, for for Damien, sodomy is really any act uh, that 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 any any sexual any attempt to use the sexual act in a way that is unnatural. I would say that that does exclude. He does actually distinguish sodomy from bestiality. So there's an example, uh, an unpleasant example of something that would not actually technically fall under that category. It would be something that would not involve uh, some perversion like that exactly. But in general, sodomy is applied, the term is applied by Damien to any any unnatural sexual behavior. So interestingly, he includes contraception among acts of sodomy. Uh, he, he gives, a, as an example, the sin of Onan in the, in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. who uh, who was supposed to have sexual relations with his his uh, brother's wife after his brother died? There was sort of an there was an obligation uh, that's mentioned in the the law of the Old Testament to do that, but um, but uh, without being too graphic, he uh, he 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 withdrew from from the from his brother's wife before the completion of the act, and so this of course God. God uh, struck him dead for doing this, and Damien discusses this in the context of sodomy, a clearly identifying it as a type of sodomy uh, on a continuum with other kinds of sodomy, which would include um, self-abuse, masturbation, mm-hmm. and and uh, obviously any kind of same-sex interactions uh, between uh, two men, two women. Specifically, though, here, of course, he's addressing it between uh, men. Because he's addressing this as a crisis in the uh, in the in the male clergy, and and that's the principal issue at hand. So all of those are types of sodomy for for, for Peter Damien, and I think that that's one of the very important aspects of the book, actually, because uh, today uh, there's a there is a, a a very widespread acceptance among Catholics of of uh, contraception, which is really a form of sexual perversion. Right, and it's very similar to sodomy. I mean, it's very, very similar to what we would normally think of as sodomy. It is a type of sodomy because it involves people using other people's bodies uh, for the pleasure, but but negating the purpose, yeah, um, denying the purpose, acting against the natural purpose of the act. And this is exactly what homosexual sodomy is, except just uh, to a greater extreme. It is obviously worse because it's more unnatural. It departs even more from the nature of the sexual act, which is unitive between a man and a woman who have this. Com- these complementary, uh, uh, the, com- the their sexes complement one another, uh, and uh, but but what's the purpose of that union to bring forth life? So obviously, in both cases, those those are being denied and really in favor uh, of of lust, for des- out of a desire to to receive the uh, lustful pleasure apart from the purpose of the act. So Damien sees all of this as a continuum. You know, one of the things that I found interesting in what you wrote, and I'm going to quote it. It's um, 
You write, he notes the severe penalties historically attached to such offenses in the scriptures as well as the canons of the church councils and argues that such penalties should be even stronger for members of the clergy. One of the things that isn't happening, or at least we perceive it not to be happening today, is accountability. That, you know, it wasn't happening back then, and he's saying, hey, people need to be held accountable, especially the people who have the title of shepherd and servant of the people have to be held accountable. And he wasn't mealy mouth about it. There was one part that you said they are to be publicly beaten and humiliated, bound in iron chains, worn down with six months of imprison- imprisonment, and three days every week to fast on barley bread at sundown. Man, he was yes. he was not um, at all ambiguous as to what the punishment should be for people who allow themselves, one, to fall to the sin of lust in such a tragic and tremendous way, but two, those people who are in charge of the faithful. Uh, that just spoke volumes to me about who St. Peter Damien was about and what I could expect from the Book of Gomorrah. Now, real yes. quick, though, you, you bring up the concept of homosexuality and homosexual orientation. Did he have more to say on that particular topic um, other than what you just uh, mentioned? Yes, uh, uh, he did. I, I would like to just uh, clarify something about that quote that, that you gave. Um, that quote, uh, that that recommendation of, of punishment that you were just mentioning, where, where the person would be imprisoned in a monastery and forced to fast on barley bread and, and so on, that was that's an old canon that that it, that it was an old law. In other words, it was a it was a, a canonical penance is what they, those were called that existed in various collections of canonical penances in the Middle Ages that he's citing, but that's specifically for those who are cap, who are caught. In uh, in an attempt to to seduce a a, a child, mm. so he's spe- he's specifically talking about that there. Um, uh, the those who are guilty of sodomy uh, with an adult, it's still also heavily punished in the canonical penances, and he talks about that too. Uh, and and yes, that it should be it's it's worse e- even for a for a priest. Um, but but that specifically that one that 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 canon actually requires. Uh, apparently imprisonment for life in a monastery that the person is not is not allowed to leave that he will perpetually be in the uh in the care of two monks who will be monitoring him at all times even after he goes through this period of fasting and imprisonment that he's sort of in, in the, cu- the the custody of of monks uh in perpetuity it seems it doesn't seem that there's any end to that penalty so i just wanted to mention that um but you you were asking me you're asking me then about the the how Damien understands the issue of homosexuality in in the Book of Gomorrah. Yeah, if he uh, expanded on that a little bit more than uh, what you previously said, the reason why I asked that question is a lot of people today, especially in the United States, are very quote unquote tolerant, and I say that word loosely because it's mostly a celebration of rather than a toleration of alternative lifestyles, if you will. And so I was wondering uh, if St. Peter Damien, back in his day, would have shared, you know, sentiments that we would find, say, with Father James Martin or anything like that. No, definitely not. Uh, no, the, the Book of Gomorrah is, is, is definitely, it's a book that condemns in the strongest possible terms the, uh, the sin of sodomy. And it, and it points out the destructiveness of the sin for the for 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 the church in general, that it brings down the condemnation of God, the wrath of God upon upon the church, upon uh, the 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 priest and his congregation, even uh, that certainly that uh, that the priest can't carry out his functions as well, uh, although he doesn't deny the priest's sacraments are valid. That still that it's displeasing to God because it's a sacrilege that the priest is offering those sacraments while he's living in that sin. Uh, so he's very unsympathetic with it. Uh, he doesn't have a concept of homosexuality the way that we do today, in which we would have we would think of a person having a perpetual uh, fixation on same sex attraction, for example, this sort of constant same sex attraction. There was no concept of that at the time, so he's generally treating uh, 
sodomy as a, a simply a sin that people may end up committing for various reasons. But he does have a very, very incisive psychological analysis of those who are attracted to sodomy. Um, he, he, he says that, that he, he points out that it's really fundamentally an irrational, it's a deeply irrational attraction because the person uh, is not is not attracted to what to to something that to 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 something that complements him that would com- give him completion, but he's rather being attracted to to him to what he already has. And he just points this out: is that the, the man the man's body? You know, the, the, why would a man seek some kind of completion in the body of another man? You won't find anything in this other man. He says that you don't already have in yourself. So he does get into the psychology of it and uh, addresses that in a critical way. But the actual concept of homosexuality, of homosexual, you know, homosexuals being an oppressed victim group or something like that, that didn't, uh, fortunately, that, that did not exist at the time. So he doesn't directly address that. Ah, and that's one of the things that I, I you know, it's interesting that you, you brought that out. In your translator's preface, you, um, on page 54, and by the way, folks, if you get a chance to buy this book, and it's pretty easy to buy this book, you can find it on Amazon. All you got to type in is his name and the and the title of the book, you know, Book of Gomorrah. You might find a couple other translations out there, and we'll probably address that later in this conversation. But St. Peter Damien seems to also be speaking not just to his time period, but to our time period. And he's talking to his brother priest, you know, speak, O oh, emasculated man, Respa- respond, O oh, effeminate man. What do you seek in a man that you are unable to find in yourself? Just like you were saying. And when we look at our priests today, one of the uh, one of the con- uh, criticisms that I hear a lot is that, and not just our priests really, but from the pool that they've been taken, which is, you know, guys all together, you hear the terms effeminate and emasculated, and it seems to be a very popular thing. So um, it's so apropos to uh, not just a history lesson, but really learning from these lessons of history. Now, um, moving to the next portion of our conversation, when we look at the Book of Gomorrah, uh, aside from the chains that we mentioned earlier in the in the fasting, how does it address the homosexual abuse of minors and seminarians by clergy? Well, um, as I mentioned, yeah, that that penalty that specifically that penalty is um, uh, the one that you cited is 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 the penalty that Damien discusses. Uh, and it it indicates what Damien's standard would be for those who, who would engage in an act of child sex abuse, and that is that the person should be re- should be publicly humiliated and imprisoned, and then uh, removed from society, essentially taken away and placed into a monastery where he's under the guard of monks in perpetuity, so that he could never again uh, do such a thing. And and in fact, actually, um, he says that this is this would be the case even if if the priest is simply caught uh, kissing. Uh, Kissing a child, you know, obviously would be obviously some kind of sexual kiss. I mean, not just a, you know an innocent kiss, but but that's 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 how he he's, he puts it. So he he tells he tells us this is how this is how this needs to be done, and this was not his idea. Even this is this is an old canon that had been passed that had been passed around and republished in different um, different books of canons, books of laws of the church uh, regarding this sort of crime, this sort of sin. So he definitely would not agree, I would say, Damien does not, would not agree at all today with the the treatment that's been given to priests that commit these acts by their bishops, in which they send them to a psychologist, the psychologist says they're better, and then they put them back into ministry. Um, it, it, he would have, that would have been absolutely anathema to him, and not only to him, but, but also uh, the the church in, in later years had very strong uh, penalties for for such behavior, which were not being enforced during the last few decades, but they were in effect uh, previously as well. So yes, Damien is, uh, definitely takes a stand on an issue that's very important to us today. So, I, being the year scholar Saint uh, Peter Damien, how what's something that we can learn from Saint Peter Damien and how to hold uh, our clergy for to account 
for uh, for today's time period? Well, I, I would say simply that we need to we need to follow not only his his example, uh, his 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 teaching that priests who commit sex abuse need to be removed. Uh, we also need to recognize that that sodomy is a very serious sin. That that priests who are have an, uh, uh, people that have a a permanent kind of orientation towards that an attraction to that kind of behavior obviously have some kind of serious problem, a psychological problem, and that that we need to take this very seriously. That they're not it's not appropriate for people to be in the priesthood who have those kinds of inclinations. It doesn't mean that a person who suffers from same sex attraction can't live a full life. Those people may may never be able to fully overcome those kinds of strange temptations that they have. Uh, but you know, m- most of us have uh, weird impulses of one kind or another, certainly irrational ones that we have to struggle against. That's that's the nature of of, of uh, fallen man. That's that's our fallen nature. All of us have to struggle against something. Uh, but uh, so people uh, can often either psychologically overcome something like that, or if they can't, they can at least learn to resist the those impulses. But it's not appropriate for them to be in the priesthood. And and that's why Damien. Uh, very clearly says that this is that they should not be permitted to to enter the priesthood. They should not be promoted up to higher grades of order if it's known that they have committed sins like this. Particularly if it's been a the worst degree of this the sin. There are, he he distinguishes different degrees of sins, uh, uh, different different degrees of sodomy, but he's but he certainly says that beyond a certain degree that nobody ever should be promoted up the the ranks of the clergy in that case. Um, and he's not he's not saying this because. He hates people who have done this, or he hates homosexuals, or anything like that. It's quite the opposite. He expresses great compassion for people who have committed these sins. Great compassion. Uh, there are some very moving passages in the Book of Gomorrah in which he talks about how he weeps for people who've fallen into this sin and encourages them very strongly to take up what he calls the barb of penance, uh, that uh, to to begin to do penance. And that that penance will help them to, to, to help to liberate them from really the, the the hellish existence that they are in as a result of falling into this sin. He describes the terrible destructive effects of the on the person, psychologically, physically, in every way. Uh, that and, and 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 he then discusses the 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 role of God's grace, the always the possibility of redemption. That no one should ever give up hope. And just uh, give up and continue in their sins. No, they should. They should uh, have confidence that God can bring them out of those bad habits of behavior, and even raise them. He says to higher, higher levels of spiritual exaltation than before. That they can make. He can make them even holier than they ever were before they fell. Um, but just that they are not. It's not appropriate for people who've passed beyond a certain level of this sin to be in the priesthood, to function as priests, they need to be removed from the priesthood. And obviously, if they have a problem with it, they shouldn't shouldn't be allowed into the priesthood. So it's very compassionate. It's not hateful at all, but he's very firm, and it's the kind of firmness that we really need today in the church, I would argue, because we have become extremely tolerant of something that is is very destructive and that it's not, it's not a charitable kind of tolerance at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, Damien discusses this too. That it's this uh, it's this sort of uncharitable, unkind uh, sort of tolerance that people uh, seem to wish to uh, to give to people who commit uh, sins like this. That it actually does terrible damage to them to tolerate it, to to accept it, or to treat it as if it's not a grave evil. It's not real love at all. It's actually it's actually hateful. It's indifferent to the good of 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 the sinner. So it's a very compassionate, compassionate, loving approach, but it's also a very firm approach. Uh, that clarifies uh, the, the 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 severity, the gravity of this terrible sin, and and what we need to do to to protect the church from an infestation of homosexuality in the clergy. I tell you, one of the reasons I brought up the uh, the former college where I studied, it seems like um, you know people are in our time. Not that it hasn't happened before. Obviously, things have happened and things were happening at their time. But the loss of the sense of sin um, in the world seems to have crept very deeply into the clergy to where we have folks who are probably good-hearted in, in their intent, where they're trying to minister to our same-sex brothers and sisters, and um, but they seem to be affirming uh, 
a different sort of identity. Rather than affirming what St. Peter Damien rightly points to as being created in the image and likeness of God, for now it seems like we're accepting any sort of self-identity to where, uh, you know, a man can identify as a woman and lo and behold, if you don't accept that, then somehow you're wrong. Um, it, it's tragic. So yeah. yes. for for me, looking at our current um, our current scandal, I would you know I would have pointed to the the 1900s, uh, especially with the sexual revolution, as being one of the main causes for what we're seeing today. What occurred? I know that we touched on a little bit, but what occurred in, during that time that made this sort of behavior so pervasive? I mean, was it the Magyars, like you're saying? I mean, like what was going on that? people thought that this was okay, especially within the clergy? Um, well, there certainly was no ideology. There wasn't a homosexualist ideology that it, well, like the one that we have today. Uh, people involved with this sin and att- attraction to this sin have organized themselves today, and they, uh, they've, they've made themselves into a very loud pressure group. They've managed to gain the, the support of very powerful people in, in our society. I would say that that's not what existed at that time. I think that it was simply uh, simply a, a, low, a general lowering of moral standards. Um, much of it probably had to do with ignorance of the faith, uh, and, and it had to do with the terrible disruptions in the society. I mean, society was much more brutal, much more coarse. Italy had become an, literally an armed camp over the preceding centuries. Uh, er- everything was behind Walls. Uh, all this, the towns were behind all these walls to protect themselves from these marauding invaders that could attack at any time. And it's for that reason also that we see very little intellectual output during that period. Monasteries still exist in Europe, and there are monks with their monastery in the, with their libraries, their monastic libraries, and they're still studying. But the level of scholarship drops dramatically during that period. The level of intellectual output, and so. The, the disorder in the church uh, perhaps makes it di- more difficult at that time to crack down on on uh, moral scandals, and uh, people just become accustomed to lower uh, levels of morality, lower standards of morality in general, perhaps. Uh, that's the best explanation that I can, I can really give of that. Um, and there's a lot of cynicism, too, probably in, in part because the papacy itself had fallen into a terrible period of corruption. Uh, really, uh, there are two periods uh, when we look back into history uh, in which the pa- papacy fell into very significant corruption. Um, one was this period from about 1040, uh, 10, but uh, I'm forgetting the, the year exactly. I'm sorry, not 1040, sorry, uh, 840, 847, 848, uh, running all the way to 1049. During that period, there were a number uh, of, of popes either who were sort of pers- seen as as puppets of secular rulers, or worse, they were very, very personally corrupt. Their personal lives were extremely corrupt. So they had set a very bad example. Um, and and it was because really the city of Rome itself was to a great extent cut off from the influence of the, of the emperors, uh, the German emperors. Uh, it was cut off from the rest of society and its influence. It was under the influence of very, very powerful local strongmen. Mm. Um, and again, these were tough people. Um, and so the society was coarser in general. The papacy had become a, a bad example in certain ways, or at least the, the, the popes themselves individually, not the papacy. And uh, there were other bishops that were living in very worldly ways also. Uh, that was a terrible problem, and uh, Damien, uh, Damien fought against that as well. His letters were constantly being written uh, and they were published publicly denouncing the, uh, the bad behavior of bishops and priests. So I would say it was just a general lowering of morality due to the chaos of the time. Not exactly the same situation we have today. Yeah, but I can definitely see the the relation, like um, catechesis in the last half decade or so, or not half decade, sorry, half century or so, uh, if not a little bit more than that. When people are catechizing just via coloring books, it seems like, at least that's what I grew up with, it's tough to know what you really believe in if, if yes. it's very, um, if it's, uh, for lack of better, better terms, mealy mouth, I guess. Um, so that makes sense. 
Now, you do mention scholarship, and I have to bring this up. In the book, you mention uh, about some scholars claiming the Book of Mago- uh, the Book of Gomorrah was not well received by Pope Saint Leo the uh, the Ninth. What what do you make of these claims? Yes, but th- that's that's been a strange sort of trend in scholarship in the last century or so um, in the Anglophone world, in the English-speaking world. We don't really see it outside the English-speaking world, but among English-speaking scholars, this notion arose, and it really probably originated, sadly, with a misguided Catholic encyclopedia article. Uh, This uh, appears... There was a uh, this this new trend in scholarship. It begins with a, a strange Catholic encyclopedia article uh, that addresses uh, addresses Damien in the Book of Gomorrah, and it claims that uh, Pope Saint Leo the, Leo the Ninth. Uh, this is an interesting aspect of the period is that you have two saint popes in this century, in the 11th century, and really saint popes are very rare in the second millennium. Very few saint popes in the second millennium at all, but there are two in that century, both of them great crusaders against the corruption in the church that were working closely with Peter Damien. He knew both of them. Um, one is, is saint Pope St. Leo IX. The other one was, uh, uh, what is it, Gregory VII, who was Hildebrand, um, better known as Hildebrand. Uh, and, and, and Damien knew both of them. So uh, in, in this period— um, uh, so Damien's writing his 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 letters to principally to the popes, uh, or in many cases to the popes. In this case, specifically to Pope Saint Leo the Ninth. And there's this notion that arises in this article that Leo the Ninth sort of rejects Damien's recommendations. He uh, he sees them as too harsh, these uh, for for addressing the crisis of sodomy in the church, too harsh, and so he moderates it. And then this strange idea, it begins to be repeated in other scholarship, particularly by people who are trying to uh, trying to soften Christ, the Christian condemnation of sodomy. They pick this up, and it, the story gets, it gets more and more exaggerated, that he even rebuked Damien and uh, rejected uh, his approach in a very strong way, and that Damien even felt, uh, felt uh, harmed by that, felt, felt hurt by this, and uh, objected to his his poor, poor treatment, and it's strange because these are not in the text. They, they're just not in the text, and I point this out in the the, the preface to the book. But what finally, when we get to uh, uh, John Boswell, I guess is his name, the scholar who is a uh, uh, was a homosexual. He actually died of AIDS, um, mm. and he tried to uh, he, he wrote a book on Christianity and homosexuality. He he repeats the story and he made it very popularized it a great deal. And it's all to attempt to sort of undermine the power of Damien's uh, treatise against sodomy. Well, it turns out that none of these things, none of these things are true. You can't, you, you have to do all this speculation by taking out these elements of the text out of context. And what I show in the book is that in fact, the claim that Leo the Ninth sort of softened Damien's recommendations for dealing with the crisis is exactly the opposite of the truth. He actually made the penalties more rigorous. I think I'm the first point person to actually point this out. <laughs> I don't think that's ever been pointed out before. Well, I can't and now imagine that. are starting to pick it up. Yeah, but 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 it's actually the case that if you look closely at the penalty that 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 uh, Leo then because what happens is Leo responds to Damien's work. He says uh, he 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 praises Damien in the highest possible terms. I don't know. I don't know if any pope has ever praised a saint uh, or a, a, an interlocutor publicly the way that he did <clears throat> Damien. He, he predicts that Damien is going to go to heaven. He's going to be surrounded by all the souls that he saved. He praises him in the highest possible terms, and then he says, "Okay, here's my ruling about how we should deal, how 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 one should deal with the the this problem of of clerics involved in sodomy," and then. He actually imposes conditions that are actually that are that are more stringent than Damien uh, wanted to impose. I mean, he, he imposes he imposes penalties that are more stringent that cover more kinds of cases than Damien wanted to cover of sodomy. So um, he, it's actually stronger than what Damien was recommending. So it's it's really a it's a complete fiction. It's a unfounded and worse, it's really a fiction. You know what? It's it's not surprising to me, especially with the agenda that. That priest had gone in with uh, trying to discredit 
St. Peter Damien, which, you know, inclines me to ask this question with such a quote unquote tolerant world that we have today. What's the reception of uh, the book been like for you? Well, actually the I've, I've been, I've been very pleasantly surprised. The, the book has been widely reviewed. Um, a large number of publications have reviewed it. Uh, all of all of the reviews have been positive. All of the reviews on Amazon are positive. Uh, the book had a had a burst of sales when it came out in 2015, and now with the the McCarrick, the renewal of the crisis with Cardinal McCarrick and and all of that, there's been uh, an explosion in demand for the book. It's selling very very rapidly now, and uh, I found that. I, I I can't recall anyone reacting negatively to the book, actually. And I think it's very hard for people to react negatively because Damien is such a compassionate saint. Uh, he's he's he, he's no one can accuse him of, of hating anyone, which is usually the strategy of the homosexual movement of the LGBT movement is to accuse anyone of being filled with hatred if they disagree with these perverse forms of sexual behavior, which is, of course, the opposite of the truth. It's motivated by love. It's motivated by charity. We don't help people by telling them that their sins are okay and that that we accept the sin and that uh, that they shouldn't feel badly about it. It's, that's not helping anybody. It wouldn't help them. To, it wouldn't help an alcoholic to, to tell him that, that. Tell him that and to tell him that give him this false sense of identity you were talking about, which is so poisonous today. That telling people that this is your identity instead of that your identity is that you were made in the image and likeness of God. The devil wants us to accept these false forms of identity, right? Mm. So Damien, Damien is – it's impossible really to accuse him of hatred. He doesn't come across as hateful, but he impassionately uh, – uh, passionately, uh, passionately, sorry, um, and uh, with much compassion denounces the sin of sodomy for its destructiveness to the person, what it does to the person and what it does also to the Christian community when it's tolerated. And uh, and so it's very hard to to see it as any kind of hateful book in any way, except towards the sin itself, not towards the person. So it's and it's it's a beautifully written book too. The Book of Gomorrah is an amazing book. It's very very powerful and very beautiful. So it's been very very well received actually. I'm, I've been surprised in a certain sense given the 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 strength of his his the the force of his arguments against a form of behavior that today we're told is as per- perfectly innocuous and as some kind of even human right, you know. Right. Well, I'm pleasantly surprised to hear that. That's great. Now, you know, we mentioned the date 2015, and then we mentioned two other translations previous. I'm kind of curious, if this has been around for that long, uh, what made you write, uh, translate a new one in 2015? And if I'm also not mistaken, there's a new, tra- uh, you're translating it a new language as well. Uh, well, yeah. I, well, I won't be translating it into Portuguese. It, it will be translated into Portuguese. Um, the uh, Brazilian public publishing house Ecclesia has um, signed a. We've signed a contract, and they're going to uh, translate it and publish it in Brazil. Um, but yes, the the there there were two other publications of the Book of Gomorrah in English before my translation came out. Uh, the reason I went ahead and did the translation uh, was. Was twofold. One, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to present it in the context of the modern crisis in the church, uh, not just even the crisis of, of of homosexuality in the priesthood, although that's a major part of the crisis, but in general, I wanted to present it as I wanted to present the Book of Gomorrah as, as a major part of Peter Damien's general struggle against corruption in the church, his courageous structural uh, struggle against corruption, his willingness to speak uh, very forcefully. Uh, very, very respectfully, but also very forcefully and clearly to wayward prelates, to bishops, to even to popes. He would scold popes if he thought that they were not doing the right thing. But his his own holiness of life was so was so well known that that it was it was really impossible for them to take it badly. Uh, they uh, they they respected him so highly, and everyone else did that he was able to 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 strongly criticize them. I wanted to present that whole story. But there's also the fact that, sadly, the two translations that that precede this one uh, are both actually flawed. Um, one was was done by the original one. The first one done in English was done by Pierre Payer, who is a, a, a now a retired scholar. I believe he was at the University of, if I'm remembering, if it's the University of Toronto. It's a Canadian university anyway. He um, he translated it in 1982. 
And he did the best job he could. The problem is he did not have access to the critical edition of Peter Damien's work. He had uh, he had access to an edition, an edition that had been heavily edited and modified. It's called the Gaetani edition. That came out in the 17th century, and that was all he had access to at that time. He tried to get a a, a copy of a, a, man, a medieval manuscript so he could take it directly from the original manuscripts, but he wasn't able to get that. So there are some serious. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's still you can get a lot out of Payer's translation, but there are some there are some serious translation errors, and there are some omissions too, because Gaetani actually cut out parts of Damien's work, which were too strong. And and that's the reader has to be warned about this. Damien is is very precise in his description of some of the things he's talking about, these immoral acts that homosexuals can commit. And it was such racy stuff that um that Gaetani actually removed some of it. And so Pierre Payer's edition also has that material removed. And then the other one was done by Owen Blum, who who translated all of Damien's works, actually, or he did most of them. Someone else finished Blum's work of translating the, the uh, well, not all of the works of Damien, but all the letters of Damien. It's almost all of his works. The problem with Blum is that Blum had an extremely loose translation style. It was kind of sterile, and it was kind of, and it was very loose, and in many in cases, it's not fully accurate, sadly. And that's not just been pointed out by me, but the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy actually discusses the problems in Blum's translations of of um, Damien. So, uh, so neither of the translations are really adequate. The Blum translation is just part of a of a volume that has a bunch of different uh, letters of Damien, and uh, the Pierre Pair version can be found online too on at, at Amazon. Uh, but I, and it's, it's rather expensive. It's an academic edition and it's kind of expensive. Um, so what I wanted to do was bring out a translation that really brought out the beauty of Damien's Latin that was scru- scrupulously accurate and also actually affordable My my, my cop, my, uh, edition is, is, is a $18 a copy on Amazon. So it's not, and, and you can get it, you can get the ebook for $5. So I wanted to really bring this to the public. I also provide a lot of, um, a lot of footnotes so that people can really understand the context of what they're reading. I've been criticized that the footnotes were actually excessive, <laughs> that I <laughs> belabor the obvious in the footnotes, but I just wanted to make it, and probably it's true, but I just wanted to make it as accessible as possible, that if there was any confusion about what the reader was reading, that they w- could look at a footnote and it would explain what they're looking at, because sometimes, obviously, medieval works can be difficult to understand, the references that are being made and so on. So I wanted it to be very accessible to the public and particularly priests, and I am very happy to report that very many priests have purchased the book. Um, I know this for a fact. It's being purchased by by priests in large numbers. So that makes me very happy to know. That is wonderful news. And when I read it, most most uh, listeners out there who have gotten to know me by now, I don't consider myself a scholar uh, as such. More of more closely aligned to the everyman. And when I'm reading this, uh, it, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't speak to me like a um, academic book where it should be read in small circles and smoke-filled rooms and with uh, you know people sipping brandy. It's this is something that will really enliven your soul. Um, I'm going to read it again a little bit more fully when I have a little bit of time. Now that uh, after our conversation, I won't be on a time crunch to do an interview. But speaking of the interview, uh, we're nearing the end of the show. And as I'm always inclined to do, I like to give my guest the final word for the main body. So if there's one thing our listeners out there should walk away with from this show, what would it be? Oh, that's a difficult question. I, I suppose I would say that that people should walk away with the knowledge that the church has passed through a number of crises in its history We're passing through a terrible crisis uh, of moral degradation in the clergy today. It's 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 a terrible thing. It's it's it can be disheartening. We can be tempted to be disheartened, but when we look back into history and we see that uh, the church has passed through crises like this before, it passed through it in this period that we're talking about. It passed through it again during the Renaissance, during that period from about fourteen fifty to about perhaps 15, the 1560s when uh, Pope, uh, Pope St. Pius V uh, comes, uh, comes, into the, comes to the papal throne. Um, 
that we've seen terrible, terrible periods of corruption. The church has weathered those those periods of corruption, and has done so because uh, there are great saints arise to 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 challenge the situation, to challenge those in power, uh, as Damien did, uh, not in a disloyal way. He's a great example to all of us of showing respect for ecclesiastical authority always, not never proposing that we go and create a new church like Martin Luther did, but but rather uh, insisting that the church must be reformed, that its practices must be restored to their integrity, that the moral standards must be enforced in the clergy and so on, and that uh, we can find in, in Peter Damien particularly a great inspiration in this regard. Um, and in and, and, uh, so many ways, uh, just to mention very quickly, he also he also rebuked the the in my my biography, my little biography of him in the book talks about this. He he, he rebuked the 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 German emperor. It was he had the title of the uh, of of Holy Roman Emperor. He he went and rebuked him directly in person for trying to divorce his wife um, and to get an annulment uh, on suspicious and flimsy grounds. And uh, and it was because he wanted to protect the integrity of marriage. That's also under attack today. So, so much of the same kind of crisis of sexual morality was going on then. And we can find in Damien and other saints like him a great inspiration. Uh, and, and, and so the great message of all of this is don't lose hope. Don't walk out on the church. Trust Christ. He founded the church uh, uh, on, on, uh, on Peter and his successors. And sometimes those successors are not are not perfect in their actions. Sometimes they're even gravely sinful. But God will protect his church. He will preserve his church. He will keep his promises, and he always has, uh, even if sometimes, as Pope, as, as Cardinal, uh, well, as Pope uh, Emeritus Benedict says, the, the, the boat looks like it's about to sink. It will not sink. We all need to, though, uh, do what we can, uh, uh, do our part. In, in protecting the church's morals and, and bringing about a restoration. So he's a great inspiration for that. And, and so uh, that's what I hope people take from the book. Amen, brother. Amen. And that musical cue that you guys hear in the background is letting us know that we're out of time for this week's episode of I Thought You'd Like to Know This Too. And, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I keyed in on, uh, I'd like to share this with the folks out there, is that just like he, just like Matthew was saying, um, it's not, it's not your identity isn't your sexuality, your sexual orientation. The Book of Gomorrah, he writes, describes in ringing, ringing prose the wretchedness of sodomy, which surpasses the savagery of all other vices and causes the death of the bodies and destruction of souls, pollutes the flesh, extinguishes the light of the mind, expels the Holy Spirit from the temple of the human heart, and introduces the diabolical insider of lust. It also expresses deep compassion for those who are consumed by such self-destructive behavior. That's, that's the Catholic Church. We, we celebrate um, the sinner, but we condemn the sin. We're all sinners. We're all in this together, just like um, what was mentioned before. Um, Matthew can be contacted at mhoffman at lifesightnews.com. Uh, Book of Gomorrah, St. Peter Damien's Struggle Against Ecclesiastical Corruption on Amazon. Uh, but before we finish, let's go ahead and bow our heads in the closing prayer. And Matthew, if you do us the honor again. Okay, I'll, I'll offer a little prayer in, in Latin. Uh, thanking God for his gifts. Gratias uh, agimus tibi domine, pro universis beneficis tuis, qui vivis et reinis in saecula saeculorum. Amen. Amen. Uh, Fidelium anime, misericordium day, requiescant in pace. Amen. And until next time, this is your host, Carlos Bursabe, continuing the Lord's work on air for Bob Olson on this week's episode of I Thought You'd Like to Know. Thank you all so much, and as always, God bless. Therefore, to think well, one has to have principles that are independent of space and time by which one can live we know that these principles exist, and we know there's such a thing as truth. Can I get an amen? Amen. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.